Right, uh, hello everybody. Um, just to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing before I do that in Bangladesh, just wanted to give you a very brief sort of overview of the subject of uh, climate and migration. And you'll notice that title, I know it's a terribly uh, few words, it's not a great way to start a presentation, but we've tended to talk about migration in the context of climate variability and change. And I think that's sort of quite important. You'll see that what the implicit message behind that is uh, about moving away from really trying to attribute why people move, okay? Uh, a bit like I had a Coke just before I walked in here just to wake myself up, uh, and I didn't think I'm going to check all of the different sodas and which one do I like. I wanted a Coke. And in a way, my decision-making was like that. And we're trying to move away from people saying, why did you move? because we're looking at migration as a solution rather than something <coughs> as a victim. And hopefully that will come out. So, uh, the context of climate variability and change, very briefly, uh, there was a project by E.C. Modin, Kathmandu, I think nicely put it up, it was either too much or too little water. You can see from the slide in front of you, the classic examples there of uh, sea level rise, too much water, and the bigger the red dots, the nastier it gets. It's to do from the IPCC, 2007. And you can see Bangladesh, as in the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, <coughs> uh, highlighted there as an area of high vulnerability. Also, too little water is shown, uh, believe it or not, from the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency image over there. You can equally see that Bangladesh can be put down as an area that has a scarcity of water. Ironically, it hits both buttons. Migration and climate change, well, it's a highly political issue, as Sam has said. Um, those pictures... Uh, if you're familiar with Bangladesh, uh, this is possibly one solution to um, climate migration, which is to build a two-metre-high double barbed wire fence between uh, Bangladesh and India. Uh, it's a one form of adaptation, I suppose. Uh, you can see the photographs from today, uh, India Today, which was a, a situation of uh, the highly political situation where uh, some Bangladeshis were murdered in uh, Assam. Um, within this situation of a highly political issue, there is a legal vacuum for international migrants. Originally they were called refugees. Of course, they do not come under the Refugee Act, 1951 Refugee Act. Uh, there is nothing there to protect migrants that are displaced, let's say, from the impacts of climate change. There's some guiding principles to displacement, but there's no legal protection. Oops. Right. So, as Sam said again, there has been some attempts in the past, and I did love this very honest line from uh, probably the, the person who started a lot of this. Uh, uh -huh. um, and he said he got these figures from heroic extrapolation, Norman Myers uh, from Oxford, and basically, they are just that. So just to give you some examples, so this is the Stern report. If you've got great eyesight or, like me, haven't, I hope I can remember it. Uh, 150 to 200 million environmental refugees. Again, refugees is the wrong word, but uh, let's, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, the um, next report, I'll get rather well, easier. Christian, <laughs> Christian report. I think unfairly are quoted as saying it was said it was a billion likes to be displaced by 2050. Um, the UN report then said that uh, much more muted it down and said there was a pressure to migrate. And of course, the IPCC then beautifully hedged its bets by saying estimates of numbers are at best guesswork. If you track where these numbers have come from, they are all based around each other and they come from a very simple idea that you say, say for instance, with sea level rise, where's the sea level rise going to occur? Let's put in that to two metres, which isn't the current projections of uh, sea level rise, and everybody who lives there will have to move. As you yourselves know, that won't occur. In England, we will probably have the money to build sea defences. If you didn't and you live, say, on the Pevensey Flats, what you might do is dig some of your land up and live on the land that you've dug up. So these estimates were based on the non-adapting people. 
Um, the framing of migration, I think, is quite interesting. <coughs> and uh, uh, Kevin alluded to this, or didn't allude, he was quite explicit about it earlier on. And I've tried to show that in this diagram. So uh, it's been called a continuum, but I prefer ellipse because I think it likes to go around in circles. On our far left is displacement of migration, so people who are forced to move, uh, say, from the tsunami as an environmental <coughs> issue, the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, on the far right, we might have something that's proactive resettlement, something along the lines of people being moved either by government, say Mozambique is a great example, but the De Cabaret Islands are where the community uh, made a decision to resettle. And in the middle somewhere, we've got seasonal circular migration. And of course, these are continuums, there's lots in between. The big circle here is how I think the general framing of climate and migration started, and that was around this view of people as vulnerable, as victims. So, uh, oh, that's going to test everyone's eyesight, that one. There's a definition of vulnerability there, and um, basically I think you all know what vulnerability means. It, it was seeing migrants as <coughs> someone who they were impacted, as something that was bad. As time went on, especially the migration community uh, got involved, they started to point out that this had a lot of parallels with migration and development. And that the possible view that migration might <coughs> be a way out of poverty. So it started to be seen as something that was adaptation. And there's a definition there. And lastly, as time has gone on, and as we all know in meetings we have to discuss this as a sort of rite of passage, what on earth is resilience? Resilience got in on the act and was stuffed into the equation as seeing migrants as somehow through their remittances and their social and financial remittances, building resilience in communities. So this is just, that's a sort of timeline of the evolution of the framing of uh, the concept. Before we go any further, I just want you to give you some numbers of what we the current situation on migration is today. That's not migration due to climate change, that is all the migration. Internal migration, this is a massive guess, right, because there is not a lot of data on internal migration, but it's about a billion. And the only reason I got a billion is because in international migration, of which there is information, is about, well, 250 million is on the high side of international migrants, and the general assumption is there's a four to one ratio in there. The question is, how many of those are going to be climate-related migrants? Is it going to be a small area or a large area of that? Of course, if you think of those numbers and then think back to the numbers I gave you earlier, there's quite a discrepancy there. When you had the 150 million to 1 billion, that's as many as we think there are internal migrants, per se. Uh, I get very confused by the numbers. Um, right, to give you some examples of how people respond to climate stresses, is two, which I'm going to go through very quickly. This is uh, Burkina Faso, a very seminal study by Sabine Henry et al. And basically they did a lot of surveys, 8,000 surveys of households, and they found that if you moved, if you had a drought, your short distance migration, tendency to short distance migration increased, your tendency to long distance decreased, because you didn't have the resources to migrate. Turning to another part of the world, and this is admittedly not all climate, but El Salvador on a paper by Halliday, and it was said that there, when there was a loss of harvest, international migration went up. That's the reverse of what I've just mm. said mm. with Burkina Faso. And when there was an earthquake, again, not uh, climate, but actually it decreased. So trying to find generic rules about how people respond, as we all know in case studies and very context, depends on the different situations and the different abilities for people to move. In El Salvador's case, was it related to the Americans opening up their borders in response to Hurricane Mitch. We've heard about foresight. I think the, the thing to finish on the framing, which I really like about foresight, is foresight trying to move away from why did you go, why did you migrate, to saying that your decision to migrate was a <coughs> complex <coughs> mixture of reasons. Like I said about my Coca-Cola, that was a subconscious, not subconscious, non-conscious reason. So they put on the left-hand side, very Sussex, a, uh, a nice uh, pentad, which has got, um, it wasn't sustainable livelihoods though, it's got political drivers or determinants, environmental determinants, demographic ones, social, 
and economic. And of course, economic is generally seen as the major reason why people migrate. And the influence of climate change is, tends to be on those drivers rather than, so it increases the pressure to migrate or changes the pressure ability to migrate rather than causing it directly. An increase in rainfall doesn't cause you to migrate, but what its influence on your crops does. A number of people have criticised this con uh, conception, but I think it was really good as it was basically, it was really good in basically moving away from saying why people are moving to saying if they move, does it put them in a better situation to deal with subsequent stresses from climate change? Right, now turning to Bangladesh. So, uh, just I'm sure you all know where Bangladesh is, but the top left shows you. Of course, it's a giant delta that uh, receives the, the waters from three main rivers, the uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Omega. Uh, and you can see Dhaka right in the middle of the country. And of course, being a delta, a lot of the country is very low and susceptible to sea level rise. Um, it's also highly vulnerable to populations. If you, uh, that diagram uh, shows you the percentages of the population that are uh, in extreme poverty. And just to give you an idea, that dark brown is over 45%. So those are the high level of poverty in various parts of Bangladesh. It's also had some changes over time of flooding. Here's the estimate of above normal flooding in Bangladesh. Now, I'd just like uh, you to stop for a second. Above normal, I thought that was a, a lovely understatement. On the left-hand side, you'll see the percentage of inundation area. And as you can see, one of those red lines in, uh, two, in 1998 was up to 70% of the country inundated. Imagine if it happened that in the UK, if it happened in the UK. These are the amount of people that were killed by cyclones, the wind speed over time. And as you can see, there's been some huge things <coughs> in the past, not least 1970, when 500,000 people were killed by cyclones in Bangladesh. Right. So the project basically had a mixed methods approach. We did some focus groups, we did some uh, <coughs> surveys, and we did some life histories. So the life histories is the main quantitative angle of it, and that's the bit I'm going to talk about. Uh, so this was 1,502 uh, household surveys. This is some census data, and you can see these are for Upper Zilla, so the small areas in Bangladesh. Where you see on the left-hand side, that's 2001, you can see where there's orange is where there's the lowest population growth. Conversely, of course, population growth is telling you that if your population growth is less in one area than in another area, why is that? And that's because you're having migration. So it's telling you that people are migrating, and if you just blur your eyes, you'll see they seem to be heading out towards the peripheries of the country and Dhaka. And that's 2012. So what we did is we did, first of all, a very quick analysis where we took various stressful events, the 1998 floods, uh, Cyclone Sida, and we applied, we looked at the changes in population uh, growth rates of those areas. So this is long-term migration. And what we found is the migration rates, if you attributed, which is a, a, not a massive assumption there, that, that the reason why you're having statistically significantly lower migration rates from those areas and you can see we've got three four different stresses and so there's the migration rates there's the population changes from 2010 to 2050 and that comes from one climate model so I caution against it because climate models as you know have a huge spread of uncertainty this was a rather wet uh, scenario but basically you can see there's are in millions that if you look up to 2030, 2050, and including population growth, we're estimating uh, and sea level rise 16 at the low end million, according to this one climate change scenario, and past rates of migration that are statistically linked with these stresses. And the high end, you're looking at 26 million people by 2050. As I say, that's a very ballpark figure because it's only using one model. But it's giving you an idea. We're not saying where they're going. We're not saying they're going to India. We're just saying these people are on the move. Right. We then looked at the, uh, and this is to finish, or well not to really, uh, but to wind up to the finish. Uh, Sam, I can <laughs> see. Good. Thank you. 
basically, I'll, I'll skip through these, but basically what we found was there was a bit of a question here, what we revealed. When you ask people why they migrated, you do these migration life histories. What we found is in some cases, yes, people were migrating as a proactive response, so they, when they were worried about something, <coughs> like floods. But when they'd experienced floods, they weren't necessarily then going to migrate. So it was a proactive strategy. And when we look at something like riverbank erosion, this came out even more, that if you compared all people, actually having riverbank erosion meant you were less likely to migrate. But if you were a migrant, each time you had riverbank erosion, you'd be more likely to migrate. <coughs> now that one gets stuck in my head, so I'm going to leave you to contemplate that. Mm. I, that everybody, when you compare to everybody, you do not migrate. But once you've made a decision to migrate, each time it's pushing you more and more to migrate. An impact, I could go through these rather quickly. Well, there's a lot of argument about migration being a route out of development and a route for adaptation. I think the big one is in financial remittances and I'm going to skip to this graph which I'm sure you've all seen, 1990 to 2013 estimate, how much money compared to <coughs> FDI and ODA do, you, do we get from international remittances? As you can see, remittances in the blue, you have more money coming into a country from remittances from people's own agency than you do ODA. Mm -hmm. And so it could be a huge source of uh, poverty alleviation, resilience building. However, there are arguments about that, that it's a neoliberalist uh, uh, excuse to promote migration. So, in um, Bangladesh, this is echoed, uh, financial remittances have a huge effect, but also there's other effects of social remittances. What do people bring back? How does it change the role of, say, women, uh, intergenerational dynamics, and so on? Um, yet, why are we right? So what we ended up with was after all of this work, well, what should we, we be recommending to the, uh, to the university, to the government of Bangladesh? And the, bang the government of Bangladesh is, as I think many of you know, very ahead of the game in climate change, and especially climate change adaptation. A highly resilient people, and essentially, they have a lot of policies that attach uh, importance to climate change. What we were saying is the major point of all of that, if you're not going to read it, is look at migration as an option rather than a threat. It's not a sign that you failed, but a sign as a possible route out of increased stress. Even if it gives you money to, well, however it's occurred, to help you in future build resilience against other climate change stresses. And l lastly, to finish, ways in which we thought you could have policies towards that are by encouraging skills training in areas that are affected by <coughs> climate threats. So what you're saying is in the process of migration, if people are going to do it, make them get the most benefit from that process. And to do that, Bangladesh has a lot of skills training. Train those in particular areas where uh, migrants, you might expect more migration because of these climate stresses. Right, sorry to go over. No, that was great. Thank you very much indeed, Dominic.